This is a Fox News alert. I'm Brett Baer in Washington. We begin with a huge consumer story that quite possibly affects you or someone you know. Another 17 million cars and trucks in the U.S. will be recalled to fix a potentially deadly problem with airbags. The federal government and Takata announced a deal today that will bring the total number of recalls to almost 34 million, making this a record-breaking recall. Correspondent Doug McKelway is here tonight with this story. Good evening, Doug. Evening, Brett. This is the largest recall in American automotive history affecting these brands of cars which Takata airbags are installed in. BMW, Chrysler, Ford, General Motors, Honda, Mazda, Mitsubishi, Nissan, Subaru, and Toyota. But up until now, Takata has refused to acknowledge that their airbags are defective. That changes today. Takata is a Japanese company. Its decision, no doubt forced in part because of tremendous pressure from the U.S. federal government, pressure that included fines of $14,000 a day. Still, in an unusual twist, neither Takata nor the federal government knows exactly what is causing the defect. We don't know when that answer is going to come forward, and we can't wait for the safety of the American people to have that answer before we move forward with a remedy that's going to work. Investigators do know that the problem lies with the inflator component of the airbag. It causes the airbags to inflate with too much explosive force, sometimes rupturing upon deployment, producing fragments that can kill or seriously injure. At least six deaths and 100 injuries worldwide have been associated with the defect. Previously, Takata acknowledged that one of its airbag plants in Mexico had mishandled airbag propellants and that high humidity in Gulf states might also be linked to the ruptures. Motorists who might be affected are encouraged to call their auto dealer or to enter their vehicle ID number on the website safercar.gov. One note of reassurance, Brett, the odds of being killed by one of these defective airbags is about 1 in 5.5 million, vastly less, for example, than the odds of being struck by lightning, which is 1 in 280,000. Brett? Good stat to know. Doug, thank you. Also information on foxnews.com about that. Now to politics. For the first time in almost a month, Hillary Clinton took questions from reporters covering her presidential campaign. In fact, the Washington Post reported the dry spell lasted 40,150 minutes. But did the answers measure up or advance Clinton's chances of becoming president? We have Fox team coverage tonight. Kevin Cork at the White House, where the Obama administration officials have their story about the worsening situation in Iraq, and they're sticking to it. James Rosen here in Washington with Hillary's Iraq problem. But we begin with Chief White House correspondent Ed Henry with the Clinton campaign in Cedar Falls, Iowa tonight. Hi, Ed. Good evening, Brett. When she finally engaged us, the questions came in fast and furious. The answers lasted barely five minutes. It had been 28 days since Hillary Clinton took any questions from the media. And after some urging from Fox, as she again took softballs from supporters at a bike shop in Iowa. Yeah, just wait, wait, wait. Uh, yeah, maybe when I finish talking to the people here. How's that? I might. <laughs> I'll have to ponder it. Clinton pondered, then marched to the back of the room and took questions about a series of ethical issues dogging her campaign, including the State Department claiming it will take until January 2016, the eve of the Iowa caucuses here, to release some of the 55,000 pages of her official email. I want them out as soon as they can get out. A federal judge today ordered that by next week, the agency must have a timetable for a rolling release of email as Clinton put the onus on them. Well, it's, they're not mine. They belong to the State Department. Clinton said the emails will show her to be a strong secretary, and nobody has a bigger interest in releasing them than her, though she already deleted 30,000 personal emails and has not released official ones on her own. After she revealed at her last full news conference in March, she had control of all email on a personal server. Amid new questions about Clinton sharing sensitive information with longtime advisor Sidney Blumenthal, who had business dealings in Libya, and according to the New York Times, Blumenthal sent various sensitive memos about Libya to Clinton's personal email, warning her, for example, that al-Qaeda militants were plotting attacks against the U.S. <laughs> I have many, many old friends. While Clinton laughed at the question, former CIA official Mike Morrell recently declared he believes more than one foreign government gained access to her server, raising questions about what else Blumenthal sent her. He sent me unsolicited uh, emails, which I uh, passed on in some instances. Uh, 
uh, and I see uh, that that's just part of the give and take. When you're in, when you're in the public eye. Adding to the intrigue, Blumenthal was paid by the Clinton Foundation. I am so proud of the foundation. I'm proud of the work that uh, it has done and that it is doing. It attracted donations from people, organizations uh, from around the world. As Clinton unveiled a small business initiative, she was pressed on how she can stand for the middle class when she and her husband last year raked in $25 million from speeches. Well, obviously, Bill and I have been blessed, um, and uh, we're very grateful for the opportunities that we had. Uh, but we've never forgotten where we came from. Now, another question was a curveball from one of her supporters who asked her what her position is on the Pacific trade deal. Clinton backed it as Secretary of State, but has been waffling under liberal pressure. Today, she hedged again. Brett? Ed Henry in Iowa with the Clinton campaign. Ed, thank you. With ISIS terrorists capturing the key Iraqi city of Ramadi over the weekend and with GOP candidates struggling to say whether the Iraq war was worth it, Hillary Clinton now faces challenges to her reputation for foreign policy savvy with fresh questions about her role in the conflict. Chief Washington correspondent James Rosen has that angle. In finally taking press questions among the first Hillary Clinton faced was about her vote in 2002 approving the use of force by President George W. Bush to overthrow Saddam Hussein in Iraq. Look, I know that there have been a lot of questions about Iraq uh, posed to candidates uh, over the last weeks. I've made it very clear that uh, I made a mistake, plain and simple. Yet the matter of Mrs. Clinton and Iraq is far from simple. The former Secretary of State has elsewhere suggested she was, in effect, duped into approving the use of force. Uh, it was not used as I had expected it to be used, and the entire uh, implementation strategy uh, was flawed. On my orders, coalition forces have begun striking selected targets of military importance. At the time of shock and awe, Clinton was New York's Democratic junior senator, and she herself considered the vote she now calls a mistake as a major test of her own decision-making abilities. This is probably the hardest decision I've ever had to make. Further clouding the issue is the troop surge President Bush ordered in 2007, widely regarded as a successful campaign that left Iraq at the dawn of the Obama presidency far more stable than it is today. The question we need to ask Hillary Clinton is, knowing what you now know now, Hillary Clinton, would you have supported uh, precipitous withdrawal from Iraq in this administration? In his memoir, former Defense Secretary Robert Gates wrote that he saw Clinton privately confess to President Obama that she opposed the surge for political reasons, to boost her campaign in the 2008 Iowa caucuses, where she ultimately finished third. I don't think it's going to have any effect on Hillary's chances in 2016. Most Americans have, are happy that we're out of Iraq. If Hillary and Obama had that conversation in front of Gates, of course that's damaging. Clinton aides will now say her role in the Iraq war has been fully vetted, but veteran observers don't see the issue necessarily going away. There are many nuances that she has not yet clarified, so I'm sure she's going to be asked many any other versions of the Iraq question. I think one of the unanswered questions for 2016 is going to be who lost Iraq. Clinton's liberal base may or may not be appeased by her answers. Earlier today, the New Yorker's John Cassidy noted that Clinton's position on Iraq isn't terribly easy to distinguish from that of Jeb Bush, and he lamented that the former diplomat hasn't said much during the past nine months that would help voters place her on the foreign policy spectrum. Brett. James, thank you. The Pentagon says Iraqi troops abandoned dozens of U.S. military vehicles when they ran away from marauding ISIS terrorists during Sunday's fall of Ramadi. But correspondent Kevin Cork tells us tonight President Obama does not seem too worried about the situation. At the White House, there was an air of defiance. The president hasn't given up on anything. Two days after the Iraqi government declared Ramadi had been overrun by ISIS, the administration continued to insist it wouldn't mean very much in the long run. Are we going to uh, uh, light our hair on fire uh, every time that there is a setback in the campaign against ISIL? Or are we going to take very seriously our responsibility to evaluate those areas where we succeed uh, and evaluate where steps are necessary for us to change our strategy where we've sustained setbacks? In one of those, quote, setbacks, insurgents swarmed the Anbar province capital using sandstorms for cover. The squall grounded U.S. air support, revealing a crucial limitation in America's aerial arsenal and exposing a weakness in the administration's strategy. When you think about troops on the ground popping a smoke to obscure themselves so that they can move around, 
That's kind of what we're seeing here with ISIS, using a sandstorm so that our eyes in the sky, our predators, our platforms in the air, um, our aircraft can't see what's going on on the ground. There are also renewed questions about the training of Iraqi security forces, many of whom were last seen scrambling out of Ramadi as ISIS took control. That left some to wonder about their will to fight, including National Security Advisor Susan Rice. It's an uneven force, quite frankly, uh, both in terms of the will of the forces, their equipment, their leadership, um, and that's part of the challenge that we have in trying to build it back. While its power remains limited to specific areas, ISIS and its affiliates continue to spread geographically from Iraq and Syria to Yemen and now into northern Africa in Libya. The group's first expansion outside the Middle East, creating a potential staging zone for attacks in Europe. So how is it that the White House, as recently as last month, claimed things were looking up in Iraq? The jury's still out. That's the truth. It's not over yet. But the momentum is in the right direction. But on Capitol Hill, GOP leaders rejected that notion, calling instead for an overhaul of the administration's strategy. The president's plan isn't working. It's time for him to come up with a real overarching strategy to, de to defeat uh, the ongoing terrorist threat. Brett, we have heard from the White House within the hour that the president today met with his National Security Council to discuss the ongoing circumstance in Iraq, as well as a thorough review of its strategy to deal with ISIS moving forward in Iraq and Syria. Kevin Cork live on the North Lawn. Kevin, thank you. While we're on the subject of winning and losing, Wisconsin governor and prospective Republican presidential candidate Scott Walker says he does not necessarily have to win in the early primary and caucus states to secure the Republican nomination. Walker made that comment to me a short time ago here in our Fox News Bureau. I think for any legitimate contender, they've got to place one, two, or three in the first four states. Uh, I think you've got to show strength in each of those states. I don't know if it takes winning or not. Uh, certainly, uh, we want to be competitive. If we were to get in, we'd play well in Iowa. I think we'd play well in New Hampshire, South Carolina, Nevada, and elsewhere. But uh, I don't know it's a matter of winning. It's a matter of placing. you got to show, just like a show horse, you got to show you got some momentum. And I think we can play in any of those states if we choose to get in. Governor Walker says he'll make an announcement about whether he's running after dealing with his state's budget by the end of June or beginning of July. We will have more of my conversation with Governor Walker a little bit later in this program. Up next, does the traditionally influential Iowa straw poll even matter for Republicans this time around? First, here's what some of our Fox affiliates around the country are covering tonight. Fox 4 in Dallas, as police say Sunday's biker shootout in Waco began with a parking dispute and someone running over a gang member's foot. Nine people died and 18 were injured there. Police towed some of the bikes from the scene today. Fox 25 in Boston as New England Patriots owner Robert Kraft says he will not appeal the punishment for the team's alleged role in the use of deflated footballs. Kraft says he's putting the league before his franchise. The Players Union has already appealed the four-game suspension for quarterback Tom Brady. And this is a live look at San Francisco Bay Area from KTVU. The big story, three baggage handlers at Oakland International Airport are accused of using their security clearances to get suitcases filled with marijuana past checkpoints and onto planes. Partners posing as passengers then allegedly transported those suitcases to cities nationwide. That's tonight's live look outside the Beltway from Special Report. We'll be right back.